it's been a, a complicated year um, or 18 months. Um, we're doing fine now. And I was really, you know, part of the good thing about being an overachiever is I was on top of all of the government assistance and aid that we were mm -hmm. offered. Yeah. So, um, so that was good. Uh, and I, and me accessed every penny of it, which was amazing. And it's really kept us financially uh, solvent. Um, but uh, my executive chef who has been with me for 14 years, kind of took the opportunity um, just at the beginning of the month uh, to go into a different field. Okay. So, uh, and it was really, it's one of those, you know, sort of casualties of, COVID in a way because he was like I don't think I want to do this for the rest of my life okay which was interesting you know and so as a result I'm sort of back in the kitchen full-time right now so okay. right. it is interesting also trying to rehearse and produce a play <laughs> <laughs> well now how did uh so this is I'm writing this for Georgia Voice so how did this how did this show come up when did you decide to do it well, I just turned 60 in August and I, I uh, it was literally a thought in December that I should have a big time New Year's resolution for my 60th year. So I had never done one inch show. I've never done cabaret, um, even though I've done lots of singing. And I've done lots of plays, but um, I've never written myself a show. And I thought, you know what, for my 60th year, I really want to challenge myself. And I I wanted something that was my own, that I could do outside of the restaurant and outside of that world that's so all encompassing and just especially in the last 18 months. So um, in January, I started making the steps. I called Courtney Collins, who has who came on as a director um, because she has done a lot of cabaret. And I said, how do you do it? Like, what do you, how do you, how do you start even? And she said, you know what, Mitchell, just write down some songs that you want to sing, write down a couple story ideas that you want to tell. And, you know, in, I think in both of our minds, it was going to be patter, patter song, patter, patter song, just like a normal cabaret. But because I write every day that Metro Fresh blog that you read a lot, mm -hmm. um, I sat down and started writing and I knew immediately the beats in my life that I wanted to talk about and how the story kind of came together so from january through the end of february i started writing and by the end of it i had like a, a play like a real play with um that i found music for did you how, how would you describe the show is it is it music and storytelling combined i mean yes it's it's a play with music really um it, it's not you know, in a cabaret, uh, the music is the star, right? And then you do patter around the music. In this case, it's more like a series of monologues that hit different eras and moments of my life with different people that tell the story of how I went from a sort of overachieving little, you know, earnest little boy who grew up and wanted to go to Hollywood to, for a career show business and then wound up in Atlanta making soup for a living. Were there any particular inspirations in terms of cabarets you've seen over the years? Uh, that's interesting. I don't, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I, it's not like I'd gone to a whole bunch of cabaret in my, like, like true cabaret. Um, It's more like the the sort of bearing of the soul monologue that I was okay. interested in. Okay. You know, it's more monologue. It's more written sort of literary monologue. It, it, I mean, if I can call my own work literary, but it really is like, it's more poetic and more written than just a pattern between songs. Okay. I... I, I... I adore Courtney. I mean, I think she's amazing. So I, it, it's, it's, I'm glad that you're working with her. But what, what are some things that you've learned from her working with this show? That's a really good question. She, she 
when I when I sent her what I had written, mm -hmm. she responded to it immediately. And I think she's given me a sense of purpose mm -hmm. and a sense of confidence that I don't know that I would have had without her. Okay. Um, she, uh, I think because she really likes it and she really thinks when, after she first read it, she said, Mitchell, this is kind of important, the story that you're telling. And that made me feel like I was sort of on the right path. Okay. So that was part of it. Um, but also just in terms of like the presentation of like a musical uh, uh, night, right? She, she really gets the, the rhythm of it and the, and you know, where you throw it away and where you can really take the time. And that's the, really the, the great thing of a, having somebody watch it and be a director. That's, that's why you have a director. Um, but she, and she's really good at it. And the interesting thing, Jim, is that she's never directed before. I didn't so know that. <laughs> for her, it was sort of this opportunity to go, oh, maybe I, you know, just a, a project that she could take on and, and see where it leads her as well. So okay. that's kind of cool. How long have you two known each other? So I'm sorry, I just, I lost that part. So, yeah. How long have you and Courtney known so, each other? We have known each other casually for many years, but honestly, I didn't really know her well, and she didn't know me well. We've done, uh, we've, you know, Super Jenny is uh, sort of our connection, um, and she was in a show with Super Jenny, so I met her then, and then we did a couple cabarets together that Super Jenny produced, um, just, but, you know, just sort of casually, but I knew enough to say, to get her phone number and say, hey, Courtney, it's Mitchell Anderson, you know? Um, and I saw her, of course, in the prom and I was so proud of her and she got to go to New York and do it. And so awesome, so. She, we, we saw the, I saw the prom here and then we saw it in New York and I, I met Courtney after the show. She gave us a, a Broadway tour. It was just amazing. I just, yeah. I just, so I, just, awesome. I just adore Courtney. So I'm excited about you two working together. But Mitchell, yeah. can you just talk a little bit about how difficult it was for you to come out? Well, yeah. So that's a, a, a big part of the show. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of revisiting that sort of 1980s. Uh, we were stuck in 1980. You know, I, I don't know how you old you are, Jim, but I, I graduated from college in 1983, landed in New York to go to drama school. Um, I was just coming to terms with and understanding my own sexuality at that moment mm -hmm. while sort of people were dying all around us, right? So there were two imperatives that I was living. I was in a circle of and had a partner that encouraged sort of a political social activist life, but I was also trying to establish myself as a viable actor mm -hmm. in, in a very difficult and homophobic world, right? Um, so that conflict is really the central piece of the play in a way and how it was an incredibly difficult time. I led people down the wrong path. I made very uh, unfortunate mistakes in my own relationship because I was very, worried about how I was going to come across and and if I was going to work I mean my chosen career at that time was acting you know I was in show business and I also left New York City uh, part of the reason I left New York City was to get away from my family and to try to come to terms with my own sexuality and be alone but I also you know being in the theater in New York and being gay was different than being in film and television in Los Angeles and being gay, especially in the 1980s. So there's a whole part of the show where I, I uh, one of the monologues where I talk about, you know, the difficulty of coming to terms with my own sexuality, fitting into that picture in my mind of what my life was supposed to be, the, my family picture, but also having this over my shoulder of my friends are dying. You know, how can I be in the closet when Timmy dies or when David dies or when Peter dies? Mm -hmm. And that was the conflict of our lives in the 80s. So uh, it was incredibly difficult. 
Yeah. And then I think that the denouement obviously is when I was at the GLAAD Awards in 1996, after many years of like, you know, sort of just getting a little bit more comfortable and living my life and, you know, being more political and being more sort of integrally involved in raising money for HIV and AIDS, working for political candidates, being sort of the gay and lesbian liaison for the Clinton campaign in 1992 in West Hollywood. Like it was, I was sort of front and center. So at the time I was playing Ross on Party Five and Ross comes out of the closet, it didn't sort of make sense anymore at that point for me to be in the closet. And really the point of the whole play is I got to live my real life, Mm -hmm. my life with my parents being proud of me and finding a real partner and a real relationship and moving out and finding a life outside of show business. So it's, 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 it's really finding that courage, I guess, and that moment in your life when you go, okay, enough is enough. This is who I am and reaping the rewards of that. After the 1996 GLAAD Awards, did people come up to you and say, you shouldn't have done that, or that, that's the kiss of death for your career? How, how did people approach you after that? I mean, obviously- Well, you know, was- I, it was, it was really, it was complicated. And I don't, I try not to get into it too much, but, you know, on, on the one hand, I felt like I had, all of these people that I knew that were in positions of power that at that moment were saying, yeah, Mitchell, you know, maybe it's time, you know, do it. And then sort of feeling a little bit like I didn't have the support afterwards. Like there wasn't, there wasn't a huge parachute or a huge, you know, uh, support underneath me after it happened. Um, however, I do believe, because I spent a couple of years after that, or really three or four years, sort of head first into the, into the activist world of LGBTQ, and, and that really became a huge part of my life. And, and yeah, I, I wanted to still work, and I did want to work, and I did work, but what was fulfilling me was the work that I was doing in the sort of the political activist arena. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the decision to move to Atlanta and what, what brought you here? Well, Richie and I met uh, at the Human Rights Campaign Dinner in uh, Atlanta in 1997. Okay. We traveled back and forth for five years um, while I was still working as an actor and traveling all over the country doing, you know, gay and lesbian work. Um, and around about the time I was turning 40, I was getting restless in my career. And we decided that I would sell my house in Los Angeles, move to New York and do more theater because that's really what I loved, right? Mm-hmm. And being gay in the theater is a little bit different than being gay, as I said, in, in a film and television. Anyway, at that time. Um, so I was in New York City on September 11th. And Richie was down here. We'd already been together for five years. I just turned 40. And, you know, the the buildings fell and life changed. And at that moment, I said, you know what? I don't need this career anymore. I can go find something else to do. And I moved down here uh, officially in 2002, the spring of 2002, found Super Jenny, um, kind of was hunting around for a different life and just found this I thing that that I felt like I was really good at and okay. she helped me and she taught me and and it was it was just uh serendipity in a way but I also uh consciously made an effort to change my career okay but and that's what that's why I landed in Atlanta because Richie was here okay you but you still did plays here and there while you were working at Metro Fresh correct Correct. I've I've done uh, over the years. I've done done work on yeah. on, and then of course, I did um, after forever. I was ask as you about well. That. Yeah. So yeah. Um, um, sorry. Go ahead. 
So, I mean, how did After Forever come up? Did, did you ever think that you'd be involved in a project like that again? Never, never in a million years. So I have a, my friend, Kevin Spiritus, who, who uh, created it, and is my co-star, um, literally called me one day and said that he was working on this thing. And, he, and I said, oh, my God, Kevin, of course, how nice of you to think of me. Send me the script. And it was such an amazing script. And I thought, God, he really wants me to do that. Like, I didn't think that anybody would think that I could do something like that again. Um, and I said, well, if I, if it, you know, if you get the money and you, and you can, and I can work it out, of course I'll come and do it. Um, because it was an incredible script. It was an amazing opportunity to do something on screen that I had never really been I mean, it was the most challenging, rangy part that I ever had, probably. I mean, maybe relax is just sex on, was, was like that as well. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, it was great. It was amazing. And mm -hmm. it kind of showed me, you know, and I think in a way, You Better Call Your Mother is an out, outgrowth of that because okay. I was around all these amazingly talented people. And like one night, uh, Kevin was, for the second season, he was raising some money um, to shoot the second season and he had some investors and he, we did like a one night um, musicale in somebody's apartment so he invited me to come and sing and just like being around those people and being around that kind of energy again really I think that's what get, got it in my mind that well you know I still have it I still I it's still part of my soul right and this whole kind of storytelling and and performance is not gone it's and i love it did you so from what i've read you're filming the third season in the spring of 2022 correct that's what the plan is congratulations did, did you ever think this would last for three seasons or possibly more than that well, no, uh, I just, honestly, I, I went and did it and it was such a great experience. I just felt like, you know, I fit really well into the character. I thought the scenes were really great. I thought it was a beautiful, I thought this first season was so gorgeous and, and I was really proud of it. And then I got nominated for an Emmy award and it was just like, like, so, so hard to like make that happen in my, in my mind. And it was amazing, you know? So no, it was incredibly serendipitous, and and I I love Kevin for for bringing me into it and and making it happen and being confident enough in me as an actor to to have me do it. So congratulations on the success of that. I, I've always thought that relax is just sex was just incredibly underrated. What, what do you remember about that? that? That was such a, a great, I mean, there were so many great people. Yeah, in that yeah, I, I agree with you. I think we were three or four years ahead of our time with yeah. it. I think it was hilariously funny. Um, Jennifer Tilly was amazing in it. The cast was incredible. We had such an, you know, uh, we went, went to all these festivals. We were at Sundance and it, it breaks my heart that nobody picked it up to, to give it a release. It, it really does. It should have had a bigger, it should have had a release, you know? At, at that time, Billy's Hollywood Screen Kiss was also at Sundance. And that's what people liked because it was, you know, more sort of mainstreamy kind of musical yeah, or kind of rom-com thing. But Relax It's Just Sex was just, it wasn't even harder. It was just more edgy or daring or, and- Realistic. You know, two years later, um, uh, Shameless is on HBO. You know, Shameless was way edgier. So like, I don't know. I just think it was a little ahead of its time. Yeah. Mitchell, with all the filming that's going on here, do, do you ever, I mean, has what she been doing whetted your appetite? I mean, if, if something, another role like this came up in the Atlanta area, would you, would you be receptive? Um, yeah, I would. Okay. Uh, I, I sort of promised myself when I stopped acting, when I left show business that I wouldn't audition anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, it's one of the reasons I, I decided to, to leave. Um, but I don't, I, that, I would, I, I may change that. Who knows? We'll see what happens in the third act of okay. my life. Great. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, uh, obviously you were talking about 
your coming out and what it was like back then. Do you think that the industry has changed a lot now? I mean, is, is it a lot safer for actors to come out or is there still a big stigma toward that? I, I would say, I would say, yes, it's a lot safer. I mean, you look at Matt Bomer, you look at my friend, Todd Watkins, you look at, um, uh, Andrew Reynolds, you look at Neil Patrick Harris, you look like there's, a, there's a lot of big, well-known television and film people that are getting parts. You know, back in my day, it was, uh, you know, what's the English actor who was in, um, my best friend's wedding, um, Hugh Grant? No, um, dark hair. Oh, Any Simon, Simon? No. Oh, what's his name? Um, Oh, oh, oh no. Rupert Ever, Rupert Ever. I'm Rupert, sorry. I was thinking of yeah. Rupert Ever was sort of the only sort of leading man guy yeah. who who could get you know gay roles and straight roles, and he was totally out and totally comfortable. But honestly, if you look at it in back in late '80s, early '90s, there was nobody else. I mean, my my friend and hero Wilson Cruz was out and proud when he was 16. Um, and still works. And it's amazing, you know, but there weren't a lot of leading man guys who were comfortable coming out. Mm -hmm. yeah. So better call your mother. It, it has I, a I have a line in the show where I, I sorry. No, this guy, I was listening. I, I missed that. No, that's like, I was. Oh, uh, yeah, I have a, a line in the show where I say, it's not like there are hundreds about gay actors running around getting TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> so Better Call Your Mother um, has a weekend run. I mean, if it, I mean, as you mentioned, tickets seem to be going, but would you consider bringing this back another time? Or is this pretty much just a one weekend gig? Uh, you know, um, I, I, uh, of course I would. Um, I had to, in my mind, think of it as a, as a one weekend thing that I was sort of producing, putting up, um, mostly because, you know, I have a more than full-time job. Sure. Um, and this is, uh, this is a total labor of love. And I was fortunate enough to, in, you know, get Courtney to do it and Bill Newberry, my musical director. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, sure. If somebody saw it and said, I would love to do a run someplace else and they would want to produce it. I would, I would try to work that out, but um, I, I'm not thinking of it in that terms. Sure. Okay. Well, congratulations. So I'm going to write this for Georgia voice. Uh, there'll be a next week's edition. Where can I, um, where can I go and find some high resolution art of you to use for those story? Uh, do you uh, just like a, a headshot or headshot? Maybe, I don't know if you have any production stills yet or, or production photos. I know. Um, I don't have it. Uh, I've got the um, the flyer art, which I think okay. is high risk. So I'll send you all um, the okay. art that I have for that okay. and my headshots. And I'll also send you the ticket information. Okay. Thank and you. I'm happy to, to, to get you comps if you want. I, I would love to see this show. Um, I'm going to write this and let me look at the dates. But so it, it's, 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 is it this Friday, Saturday, Sunday or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday matinee. Okay. I'm doing, yeah. uh, I'm gonna do a talk back on uh, Friday night and Sunday afternoon. Okay. If you want in the yeah. art. I'm to one of those, that, yeah, one of those was going great. Okay. Okay, great. Well, I'm gonna write this up and if you could just send some, some photos, that would be great. And I'll just probably follow up in a couple of days, make sure I got everything and I'll just run this next week and I'll look forward to seeing the show. Okay, great. Thanks, Jim. Thanks so much, Richie. I'm sorry. I called you Richie Mitchell. Sorry. <laughs> That's right. I'm sorry. I, I'm I am still I'm still trying to You're decompress first from last week. You, you call me Richel, which people do. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. Day. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.